Is there a difference between disagreements and hate speech? Well, the answer is yes. But in our culture, there's been such a blurring between the lines of those two that sometimes it's hard to see one from the other. Back in 2016, the Logic Dictionary posted this. Here's the way they defined hate speech. Hate speech is talk that attacks an individual or a specific group based on a protected attribute such as the target's sexual orientation, gender, religion, disability, color, or country of origin. And they continue with this statement. Some countries consider hate speech to be a crime because it encourages discrimination, intimidation, and violence toward the group or individual being targeted. Now, the Meta Company, a company including Facebook and Instagram, defines hate speech this way. A direct attack against people rather than concepts or institutions on the basis of what we call protected characteristics. And then they give a similar list of those characteristics. But notice the way that they state this a direct attack against people rather than concepts or institutions. It seems in our culture today that concepts are just as much a target of hate speech as anything else. Well, I don't agree with that conclusion. I don't agree with those facts. I think they're different facts. I like my opinion. That kind of attitude is not something that is originating in the 21st century. It's been around a long time. You find it among the Sanhedrin Council in the days of Jesus. Previously, we mentioned something that took place and is recorded in John chapter 7. The high council, um, the high court of the Jews, the Sanhedrin, has met to discuss what are we going to do about Jesus. We don't like what he's saying. We don't like what he stands for. We don't like the, what, he's, what he's telling the multitudes of people about the law of Moses. He's describing it in, in ways that we never have described it. He's really kind of opening up their eyes to things that we would really like them to have their eyes continually closed about. We don't like it. In the midst of that discussion, Nicodemus, the one who came to him by night, raises a question. John 7, verse 51. Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? The rest of the council don't answer the question. They don't even, don't even hint at an answer. They actually throw a ridicule back in the way of Nicodemus. They say, are you also from Galilee? Search and look for no prophet has risen out of Galilee. Previously, we noted that that's a false statement that they make. They knew full well, unless they just forgot, that there were several Old Testament prophets from the area of what in New Testament times was called Galilee. But what about this question of Nicodemus? Does our law judge somebody before it hears? And the answer is no. Back in Leviticus chapter, chapter 19 and verse number 15, the statement is made, You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty in righteousness. You shall judge your neighbor. You can't base your judgment upon the background of any individual or how much they're worth. And that principle is something that's reiterated in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 17. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall, not, you shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid in any man's presence, for the judgment is God's. Impartial. Is that what we see in our world today? You know, within the, the Sanhedrin, ultimately, Jesus is crucified. But after the church begins in Acts chapter 2, and after thousands actually listen and respond to that message that Peter preaches, that body of believers continues to grow. In chapter 3, Peter and John actually heal an individual that can't walk. And it serves a, as a purpose for proclaiming the message to the crowd that gathers. Acts chapter 4, the religious elite don't like it. And the way that it is stated in the beginning of that fourth chapter, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captains of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, because it was already evening. So the next day they bring him before the council. Why have you done this? Or what's your authority? And Peter makes a statement 
Let it be known to you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. They put the apostles out of the council chamber and confer among themselves, and what shall we do? Their conclusion is they really can't go against the people. The people actually are listening, but here's what they say, verse 17 of Acts chapter 4. So that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in, his, in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach the name of Jesus. Peter and John's response. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We're not going to stop. Chapter 5 of Acts. It happens again. Brought before the Sanhedrin again. And there's a statement from the council, verse 28. Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. It's an interesting side note. In Matthew 27, when Jesus is there before Pilate, and Pilate wants to let Jesus go, doesn't want to put him to death, in verse 25 of Matthew 27, the crowd cry out, let his blood be on our head and our, on our children's. And now they're complaining. You fill Jerusalem with this doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. No, that's actually what you asked for to happen. We didn't state that. You did. But the outcome of this, ultimately, verse 40, they call for the apostle to be brought back in again because they put them out of the council as they did the first time. They beat them, commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and then they let them go. And this really kind of connects a couple of concepts. It connects this idea of hate speech against Jesus with cancel culture, interestingly enough. In psychology today, there's an interesting article that was found, that I found in July of 2020, and here's what it says. The issue is July 27, 2020. What is canceling? Canceling is an individual's volitional act of publicly rejecting and actively pursuing harm against a perceived transgressor. They're going to say that canceling is vigorous, a vigorous public retaliatory rejection. When canceling someone, the canceler bypasses the legal due process. There is no complaint, no trial, no prosecution, no conviction, no presumption of innocent until proven guilty. And they'll go on to state in that article that every canceling campaign is necessarily grounded in bias. Interesting statement from psychology today. So we've taken a look at several things. The definition of hate speech from the legal dictionary or from the companies that include Facebook and Instagram. We looked at what canceling culture actually involves from psychology today. What do you see in the book of Acts? Actually what you're seeing today, canceled culture. We don't want you saying anything about Jesus. We will beat you if you do. We'll put you in prison if you do. We don't like the message. Why not just engage in a discussion with the apostles? We don't like them talking about the resurrection of Jesus. Well, then just produce the body of Jesus. End of discussion. Can't do that? So we'll just actually stop the discussion. It doesn't have to be in religious circles where people actually have practiced canceling another's point of view. Actually, our opinion, mine or yours, doesn't matter. My point of view and your point of view equally really do not matter. Ultimately, truth is the standard. God's word is the authority. But there are people that actually want to cancel that as well. Pray for our nation. We live in difficult days. Please stay safe. We'll talk again soon.